Hi, this is Steve with iFlow and welcome to our video series. This is going to be an introductory presentation. Um, it's going to be a little bit more technical uh, in its approach, uh, only because I think many of the reasons why you would consider using an iFlow combination systems are technical, so it's important to understand the factors that contribute to making a great performing combi system. So I think those are important. So we'll try and lay some of those out for you um, so that you can assess the different combi options out there for you and, and how to compare them perhaps against your traditional HVAC options. So what is an iFlow combi system? Well, in its most basic form, you can have a tankless water heater with an iFlow. So the tankless water heater would be installed on the wall and the iFlow would be installed where your furnace would be, typically on the basement floor or in a mechanical room floor. Uh, on the tankless side, cold water would come in, heat up to domestic water set point, go through the mixing valve and out to your faucet as normal. But then we can also use it to do heating. So we, we take the hot water out of the tankless, we draw it into the iFlow, goes through the hydronic coil in the iFlow and then the pump pushes it back into the tankless and then around and back again. So this is our heating circuit. So our domestic circuit would be cold in, domestic hot water out that way, and then our heating circuit. So 200,000 BTU tankless would give us 5 GPM in the middle of uh, a cold north, uh, northern winter, whether it's in Canada or whether it's anywhere in the northern USA. Uh, 5 gallons a minute, that's two 2.5 GPM shower heads simultaneously would fill a standard bathtub in 10 minutes. You've got all kinds of floor space savings uh, compared to a tank type water heater. And you get a significant improvement in your domestic water efficiency. On the heating side, no gas line required. There's no burner in the iFlow. We're actually using the hot water from the tankless. So the tankless will have the, have the burner and it will come in, the hot water will already come in. So we don't need a gas line for the iFlow. We also don't need an exhaust, right? There is, because there's no gas line, there's no burner, there is no exhaust. We're, again, we're using the, the burner of the tankless or the boiler or the combi boiler, and we'll look at that, those options as well. Uh, so no exhaust vent required. Compact size, we, our, our smallest unit is only 4.3 cubic feet, 63 pounds, so very small. Um, and a 9% on average efficiency improvement over even Energy Star rated furnaces. And we'll look at that. So, in the mechanic room itself, how would that look? Well, the tankless would typically be on the wall, feeding with a gas line over to it, with a vent out the sidewall perhaps. Um, and again, the cold water coming in and going out through the mixing valve to the domestic. Uh, and then we're tying over into the eye flow and then back with a pump. The return air drop would be the same as you would have with a furnace. The supply side, you can have an AC coil on top of the eye flow uh, connected to your out outdoor unit, whether that's a heat pump or an AC unit, uh, and then your ducting uh, to the home would continue as usual. So this part would be the same as you would have with any other furnace, no changes. The only difference is no gas line, no vent, and instead we have a pump uh, that's pushing the water through the tankless or boiler and back to the iFlow. So again, in this application with a tankless water heater, uh, with the iFlow, it's an open loop system. We're using the same potable water that goes through the tankless and out to your faucets uh, on the heating side as well. Um, we ensure that in the off season, so from May through to you know, September, for example, where we're not using heating typically, um, we are circulating that at least once every 24 hours, which is uh, in accordance with the CSA B214 hydronics code. Um, but it's also variable for those jurisdictions that require a more frequent circulation uh, or for a longer duration, those, pro those um, parameters are fully settable on the iFlow. So for example, in Massachusetts, uh, the requirement is uh, to recirculate every six hours for three minutes. Well, we can go into the controller and we can adjust from the once every 24 hours to once every six hours 
and then for the proper duration as uh, in, in accordance with the local code. So fully, uh, fully uh, changeable, fully programmable. When we're running with an open system, all the components must be potable rated. So the expansion tank, the mixing valve, all of the fittings, the, the, the piping material over, everything has to be potable rated. The pump has to be uh, stainless, bronze or composite. It cannot be an iron body pump because it will rust on the domestic side because there will be oxygen in that all the time. So, uh, just to note that on the open system, everything has to be, all the components have to be potable rated. If we prefer to go with a combi boiler, then all of the components on the heating side do not need to be potable rated because it's on the closed side of the system. The cold water will come into the combi boiler, it will go through the internal plate type heat exchanger to heat up and then deliver to your domestic fixtures. Uh, inside the combi boiler you'll have a pump and you'll have a diverting valve and then that pump will feed the water out to the hydronic coil and back. So this would be a completely closed system. So again, we can work with tankless on an open system or we can work with um, a closed system with a combi boiler or a boiler. No problem either way. The difference being uh, with the combi boiler you have the pump and you have the plate built inside. So these are typically a little bit more expensive than the tankless. Uh, and then you'll need a makeup water feed line because the closed side of the boiler uh, will need some makeup water. So you need the makeup water feed line just like you would need with a boiler. So again, combi boiler in this case with the eye flow. Again, closed system. So potable, uh, potable water for the domestic hot water is separate from the space heating. We can also run with a boiler. Uh, for example, we've got a little wall hung boiler where we're feeding out into the eye flow and then back into the boiler for reheating and for the domestic water we don't have a tankless and we don't have a combi boiler in this case we're using an indirect tank that has a coil inside so we, we put the heating through the coil and it transfers to the water that's coming in this side and out through the mixing valve so this is a boiler uh, a boiler application uh, with the eye flow and we're do using so it's a closed loop on the space heating side and we're using the indirect tank for the um, potable water. So all to say, you've got lots of flexibility in terms of applications. So just to take a look at some of those, uh, here is a combi boiler on the wall feeding over to the iFlow. Uh, this is his own system. There's another boiler doing some radiant uh, and then doing the iFlow and we've got the AC coil above the iFlow in this application. Uh, this is a closet application. You, you see the door frame where we have the eye flow, we have the AC coil above that, we have some zoning, so this is a four zone system we can see. And then over on the right we have again a combi on the wall with an eye flow with a zone system uh, with a uh, an HRV. This is another look, uh, this is a closet application, this is with bifold, so you have two doors on opening up to that mechanical closet. Again, you have the eye flow with a transition to an AC coil. You've got some zoning on top. You've got a uh, filter. And then you've got the tankless water heater that's supplying the hot water to the system. So, again, whether it's new construction, as in this case, whether it's a retrofit, whether it's a deep retrofit, which was the case in this application, uh, or again, new construction on the very right. So, all kinds of different mix and match options for you. Now, there are many jurisdictions in North America now that are focusing on electric solutions. Not a problem. Uh, in terms of the airflow, we can work with electric solutions as well. So, for example, if we have uh, an electric tank, it has a UEF of 0 0.93, 0 0.94 in many cases. So, decent efficiency, and we can then draw off that, uh, draw off that tank, bring the hot water into the hydronic coil, and then with the pump, push back into that uh, into that tank for reheating. Uh, if we're going to run with an electric water heater, um, usually the recovery is a little slower than gas, so I would, if I could, I would oversize this, maybe go up one size, so if you're thinking about a 40, maybe go up to a 50, if you're thinking of a 50, maybe go up to a 60 or 70, that type of thing, and then if you can get a double roll coil, so oftentimes you'll have a, a 4,000 or 4,500 watt uh, element if you get a double watt element or double element tank
tank, then you're going to have twice the recovery, which will uh, which will help meet your uh, heating and domestic water demand. We can also tie that in with a heat pump, for example, where we're getting high COPs uh, off the heat pump, and it's supplying the heat for most of the season, perhaps, depending on where you live. And then we can use the the water out of the electric tank as a backup, perhaps a hydronic backup. So again, lots of different options. So again, heat pump outside with a water heater. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. So we've got the heat pump uh, for AC and primary heating with the electric water heater for domestic water backup, using an, a, with a UEF of 0.93. Uh, again, with the eye flow for the forced air, and again, this is an open loop system because we're connected with the electric water heater. Um, so all components have to be potable as well. So now let's look at taking a step up from the electric water heater. Now, what if we used a heat pump water heater? So now we're getting UEFs in the range of uh, 2 to 3, 3.5 perhaps. So we're getting very good efficiency on the water heater now. Uh, and we're still using the heat pump outside. So we're using the heat pump outside for most of the, uh, for, for all the cooling and the heating in the shoulder seasons perhaps, and then relying on the backup um, heat pump water heater uh, when we need it if in the middle of winter the heat pump cannot keep up. So again, this is an open system tied in with the heat pump water heater. But again, just another electric option for you. Now, if we don't have any hydronics in the building uh, and we still want to use uh, the or we want to use the heat pump for heating, again, a, an electric solution without problem. So we're using the heat pump to deliver the heating and the cooling uh, for this for this building. Um, and we're using we can actually remove the hydronic coil from the iFlow um, and just run with the blower. So you have the blower. Uh, you have the control, the iFlow controller, you can still do zoning. Uh, you still have the option to set all of your fan speeds and, and all of the um, modulation aspects to it. But we're using the heat pump without hydronics in a, an electric solution. So, whether it's a tankless water heater, or whether it's a combi boiler, whether it's a heat pump water heater or tank type water heater, or whether it's a heat pump on its own. You bring the heat however you like it, and then we'll create the hot air on the iFlow side without problem. So what is the difference compared with a traditional system? Well, let's take a look. So we have the traditional system on the left, and then we have the iFlow combination system on the right. So on the left you have what a typical, let's say, a typical installation with a tank type water heater uh, and with a furnace. Uh, both in this case are gas fired, so you have a gas line coming in feeding the tank, and you have the same, or you have another leg off that gas line feeding the furnace. You have an exhaust for both the furnace and for the water heater. Whether if it's natural draft, you're going up through the through the chimney, through the roof. Uh, if it's power vent, then you have a sidewall, likely have a sidewall exit for your water heater. Um, but nonetheless, you're going to have two exhaust vents, one for the water heater, one for the furnace. If we look at the iFlow, as we discussed earlier, we have the tankless water heater on the wall. It has its, its uh, exhaust vent, but the iFlow doesn't have a gas line, doesn't have a vent, because we're using the water from the heat source as our... Uh, source to make the to make the hot air, uh, and we have a pump instead. So we're we're eliminating the need for a vent and substituting that with a pump that's going to run over to the tankless and back. Now, if the builder, for example, is using a tankless water heater in their base spec, then it's actually a much uh, a much easier system. So they're already using the tankless; it's already on the wall. They're already using it for domestic. Now we just have to look at the advantage of the furnace, replacing the furnace with the iFlow. And again, one less gas line, one less vent. Instead, we're using a pump to push over to the, to the iFlow. So a pump and a mixing valve. So really, that's the main difference between the two systems. So actually, we feel this system 
could actually be less expensive material-wise and easier to install than a traditional system, especially if you're using a tankless water heater as your base of spec. So what is the opportunity? Well, where builders and contractors are already installing a tankless um, or, a mod, or a combi boiler or a modcon boiler, there will likely also be a furnace. And it's, in our opinion, much easier uh, to um, introduce and replace the furnace with an iFlow uh, because of the performance advantages that you'll get. And we're going to look at that in, in a moment. Uh, so the advantage for the builder and contractor and for the homeowner, the best HVAC efficiency of any 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 gas-based system in North America, bar none. The best comfort delivery for the homeowner. An easier install for the contractors. And cost-effective. No premium for the upgrade, especially when they're using uh, a tankless water in their basis spec already. So, why use an iFlow combi system over a furnace? Well, we have to understand a concept called turndown ratio. And the turndown ratio is a simple concept. It's just um, maximum input divided by minimum input. So if you have a 200,000 BTU uh, appliance and the minimum input is 20,000, 200 divided by uh, 20, 200,000 divided by 20,000, maximum divided by minimum, give you a 10 to 1 turndown ratio. So again, just maximum input divided by minimum input. So what are the advantages? Well, let's look at a man manufacturer. We can take, there's so many different manufacturers, boiler manufacturers, combi boiler manufacturers, tankless manufacturers. We just chose one. Uh, we look at, look at the Navian. So in the MPA2 and S2, they have a turn down ratio of 15 to one. On the NCBH, their, con their uh, Navian combi boiler, um, they have a turn down of 15 to one as well. On their fire tube combi, they have a turn down 11 to 1. And then on the, the heating boilers, they have a turn down ratio of 7 to 1, right up to 15 to 1. So depends on the model. And this would be typical. Um, most of the equipment, whether it's uh, a tankless, most of the tankless water heaters are 10 to 1. The Navian uh, has a nice turn down of 15 to 1. Uh, many of the boilers are 10 to 1 now. Um, so you've got that range. The smaller the input, the tougher it is to get down to that minimum input. So you see the NHB 80 has a 10 to 1 turndown, but because the NHB 55 only has a 60,000 BT minimum or 55,000 BT minimum input, turndown ratio is a little bit lower, but nonetheless still a good performing uh, unit. So what is the downside? If you can think, if we can think about turndown ratio, it's the maximum, in, maximum input divided by the minimum input. So again, that 200,000, for example, divided by 20,000 gives us a 10 to 1. That means, it doesn't quite mean 10 stages, but you can think of it that way. The more stages, right, the higher the turn down ratio, the more, or the greater the ability of the appliance to modulate down to lower inputs relative to its maximum. So the higher the turndown ratio typically would mean a better performing unit. What is the downside of a low turndown? If I have a turndown of 5 to 1 or 3 to 1 um, or 2 to 1, for example, um, if it's 2 to 1, for example, then okay, I have a 200,000 BTU unit. And if it's a 2 to 1 turndown, it means my minimum is 100,000. Well, if I can only modulate down in two steps from 100 down to, or from 200 down to 100, what about all the applications that require less than 100? What, what do we do in those cases? So again, if I have a 10 to 1, now I'm going from 200,000 down to 20,000. So that is the advantage of the turndown ratio. So what is the downside of a low turndown? It just doesn't, it doesn't have the ability to modulate down to lower inputs. So why is that important? Well, let's look at a heating load. And we're going to use Toronto. Um, let's assume that a home in Toronto has a 60,000 B2 heating load. So what would it look like, or what would the load look like over the season? So here's the heating curve. We have the months on the horizontal axis. So we have July, August, September, October, right through. The base of this is in January and February. 
and then on the vertical axis we have the temperatures. So let's start. Well, if the outdoor temperature is uh, 65 degrees, let's say 18 Celsius or higher, we don't need any heating, right? So we're going to be off. We're going to be requiring zero BTUs, right? So this is this is where we don't need any heating. As we go through, we need more and more. So 10,000 BTUs, 20,000 BTUs, 30,000 BTUs, 40, 50, etc. Right down to where we actually need 60,000 BTUs, which is our design load for this home. Now, if we assume this is the curve, then let's look at what we need on a month-to-month -month basis. So, in August, for example, in August, so what we have in the, the dark red line is the average temperature between high and low. And then we have the actual high and low is the band width around that dark line. So, in August, even if we go to the lowest point on the bandwidth, then we're needing about 8,000 BTU. So that might be a cold night in a cold night in later August, where we might turn them, but the furnace might come on for a couple of hours. September, now we're down to again at the lower end of the bandwidth. Then we're maybe 18,000 BTUs. In October, we're maybe down to 20, 28,000 BTUs. In November. Now we're 40, uh, we're 38,000 BTUs roughly. In December, we are now about 50. And then into January and February, we have 60 and maybe 58,000. And then as we come out into March, we need less now. So now we're in March, we're about 48,000 BTUs. In April, now we're down to about 35,000 BTUs. In May, we're now down to about 25,000 BTUs. And then into June, uh, worst case, maybe about 15. So all to say, the 60,000 BTUs we need, right, where the home was designed to, it was designed, that's the worst case scenario in the very coldest days of January and February. But as we see by this curve, for the rest of the season, we need nowhere near 60,000 BTUs. In fact, most of the time we need, you know, 50,000 less or 40,000, we need much, much less, 20, right from 10, 20, 30, 40, then into 50 and 60, and then back up in the spring. So, all to say, the better the ability of your appliance to adjust to these varying loads, the better your performance will be. So the better your efficiency will be, and the better your comfort will be. And that's because the heating season is variable. And this is going to be the exact same everywhere in North America, right? Where you come out of August into September and your heating season starts, but it gradually, it doesn't go right into winter. It doesn't go right into that January, February temperatures where you need maximum BTUs. No, it's going to start and you're gradually going to get colder. And then you're going to get to the middle of winter where you need your maximum. And then it's going to get warmer again. So this you know, the, where, where this adjusts in your curve, in your, or this curve will adjust to your local area, right? If you're in Northern California, if you're in Seattle, if you're in uh, Minneapolis, if you're in Chicago, if you're in Toronto, if you're in Calgary, it's going to be different. But this pattern, right, the seasonal pattern will be the same. The temperature that you get in that season will be a little bit different, uh, but nonetheless, it'll be similar. So let's apply this turn down ratio to real life. Okay, so let's say your home has a total heating loss again. We're going to use that same 60,000 BTU load, worst day of winter. And you, do, you, inside, you decide to install a 60,000 BTU boiler with an 8 to 1 turn down ratio, giving us a minimum input of 8,000 BTUs. But on a late October night, you only need 15,000 BTUs. Now we'll go back to our chart. 15,000 BTUs in October, could that be right? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of right in the middle of that, in that range. So not a problem at all. So we've got a demand for 15,000 BTUs in this late October night. How is this boiler going to operate to deliver the 15,000 BTUs? So let's look at our boiler. It's a 60,000 BTU boiler with an 8 to 1 turndown. So if you divide 60,000 by 8, you'll get the minimum input. 
8,000 BTUs. So if we need 15,000 BTUs, and this boiler can modulate all the way down to 8, then not a problem at all. It's going to be able to deliver the 15,000 BTUs very steadily. So will this unit, will this boiler cycle on and off? On, off, on, off, on, off? Or will it run steady? And why? What do you think? What do you think? In this case, because the boiler has a, uh, an input that is lower than the minimum heating required for this October evening, it's going to run steady. Right? So the thermostat's going to call for heating. The boiler is going to come on for 60 minutes and deliver 15,000 BTUs over that 16 minutes, or the say over the 60 minutes. Right? So it's going to run continuously. The thermostat's going to be satisfied. Total heating delivered will be 15,000 BTUs. Total number of minutes on, 60 minutes. Now this is important. We will definitely get calls from homeowners saying, hey, my iFlow system seems to be running all the time. Is it comfortable, Mrs. Mrs. Homeowner? Yes? Not too hot? No. Not too cold? No. It's all good. The difference being is, the reason why Mrs. Jones is calling is because she thinks her gas bill is going to be very high. But in fact it's not. Why? Because we're not delivering 60,000 BTUs or 100,000 BTUs or 200,000 BTUs depending on the heat source. We're only delivering the heating that is actually required at the time. But we're delivering that, because we can modulate down, we're delivering that continuously through the whole hour which means it's the, the most comfortable that you can get. So the total number of minutes off, zero. Yeah, it's gonna run for 60 minutes continuously. Number of cycles per hour, just one. Just one, comes on and runs for the hour, why? Because we need 15,000 BTUs, it's gonna deliver 15,000 BTUs. So in terms of efficiency, if it's not cycling on and off and just running continuously, okay, think of it cruise control, right? You need to run, 15,000 BTUs, that'd be like setting your car at 15 miles an hour, for example, and just running it for the whole hour. You can, the car can go 40 miles an hour, the car can go 60 miles an hour if you press the accelerator, but you'll get there too fast, right? You'll have to, you'll get there quicker, um, but then you'll have to shut down and wait, you know, if, if you need to go that 15 miles an hour, for example. But in this case, we can just set the cruise control 15 miles an hour and just cruise at that. And at the end of one hour, you'll be 15 miles without problem. Steady. Uh, so efficiency will be very high because we're not cycling at all. What about temperature stability? If we're on for the total 60 minutes, delivering only the 15,000 BTUs that the room needs or the home needs, then let's say this blue line is our set point. Our delivery will be very, very tight to this red line, right? It's going to come on and just very, very tightly deliver that 15,000 BTUs. That's comfort and savings for the homeowner. We're going to look at some other options. So let's just look at Navian as an example. So again, how would these Navian appliances fare in this application, in our example application, where we needed 15,000 BTUs? So here we've got four different products, four different Navian products, and again, we can look at Renai, we can look at Noritz, we can look at um, NTI boilers, Lochinvar boilers, uh, Wiesman boilers, uh, we can look at tank type water, we can look at all kinds of different sources. So uh, I just chose one here uh, because it's, uh, it's, an easy, uh, it's an easy example, but we're, we're not dismissing any of the others. We can work with all of the different manufacturers. Uh, but in this case, let's look at the Navian. So we've got their tankless units, their 200,000 BTU tankless units, of which we're going to use 60,000 of the above the BTUs for heating. Their minimum input on this 200,000 BTU unit is 13,300, giving us a 4.5 to 1 turndown ratio. The the one the MP one eighty A two or S two is one hundred fifty thousand BTU input of which we're going to use sixty thousand for that for heating. Uh, minimum input is ten thousand, giving us a six to one turn down ratio. Right, we're dividing the maximum input that we're going to use for heating divided by the minimum input of the appliance, giving us our turn down ratio for heating only. Right, we're not talking about 
For the domestic side, it would, it would be a 15 to 1 turndown. But on the heating side, we're only using 60,000 BTUs in this example, divided by the minimum input. Gives us our 4.5 to 1 turndown ratio. Now, if, let's look at the NHB 55. It's 1,000, but close enough to 60 that I'm going to use it in this example. Um, and with an 8,000 BTU minimum input, that gives us almost a 7 1 turndown, a 6.9 to 1 turndown ratio. And then with the combi boiler, 60,000, the minimum input of 12,000, giving us a 5 to 1 turndown ratio. So, the question was how would these appliances fare in that application where I was needing 15,000 BTUs? Well, you can install any one of these appliances and the minimum input is below our 15,000 requirement. So, will any of these units cycle? They're all going to be able to modulate down to that 15,000 BTUs and run for the entire hour at 15,000 BTUs without problem. Now let's look at the furnace market, just to compare. Again, in this presentation we're trying to introduce the iFlow Combi system concept and uh, trying to show you why, um, from a technical perspective, why you should choose uh, a Combi system, a high performing Combi system. So let's go back to our home, again 60,000 BTU load. Now we're going to look at a 95% AFUE, 60,000 BTU single stage furnace. It's the number one selling SKU in North America. Why? Because it's great. It's, a, you know, it's the cheapest model out there. It's going to be, uh, you know, the price is going to be the lowest out there. So it's the number one selling SKU. Not the best performing, in, either in terms of efficiency or comfort, but nonetheless, uh, it's, it's, priced, uh, it's priced quite low. So again, on a late October night, you only need 15,000 BTUs. How is this furnace going to perform? Again, 60,000 BTU, single stage. Single, what does single stage mean? Single stage means it's not modulating. It's going to operate, when it comes on, it comes on at maximum, 60,000 BTU. So again, if we go back to the car analogy, you're driving, you're driving 60 miles an hour. There's only one speed it can run at. So you get in your car and you just hammer the accelerator to the floor, 60 miles an hour, that's all you can do. What if you need 15 miles an hour? You can't do it. You have to go your, you know, 60, 60 miles an hour and then you have to go off the brake and, and uh, or, or off the accelerator on the brake. But in this case, uh, 60,000 BTUs on the heating side, single stage means it's going to operate at 60,000 BTUs. Now, if I deliver, if I only need 15,000 BTUs and I'm delivering 60,000 BTUs when the furnace is on, because it's only single stage, I'm delivering four times the amount of heat that's actually needed. I need 15, I'm delivering 60, which means I can only run for 15 minutes of that 60 minutes in the hour. So I'm going to run for 5 minutes, I'm going to stop for 10, uh, stop for 15, and I'm going to do that three times. So I'm going to on for five, I'm going to deliver BTUs in there in that five minutes, 60,000 BTUs worth for that five minutes, and then I'm going to shut down. If I don't, I'm going to overheat the space because I'm delivering too many BTUs in, in, that shorter period, in that shorter period. So then I'm going to stop for 15, let the room cool down again, and then I'm going to come on again and deliver the 60,000 BTUs worth for the five minutes, and then I'm going to shut down. I'm going to do that cycle three times. So let's look. Thermostat calls for heat. Furnace runs for five minutes at 60,000 BTUs, delivering 5,000 BTUs in that five minutes. The thermostat is satisfied, shuts off, uh, and is off for 15 minutes while the temperature starts to drop. Why? Because we delivered a lot of BTUs in there quickly. It's going to do this three times each hour, right? Run for five, off for 15, right? That's 20 minutes, and then three cycles in an hour. So that's the way it's going to work. So the total heat delivered, three times on, 5,000 BTUs delivered each time, it's going to meet the heat demand, right? It's going to deliver the 15,000 BTUs, no question there, but it'll cycle a few times. So the number of minutes on, 15, number of minutes off, 45. How, what was our result with the previous, uh, the previous unit with the, the modulating boiler? We were on for 
60 minutes we were off for zero. Ran the entire hour at 15,000 BTUs. So the number of cycles, three. What's the efficiency? Here is where we get into the crux of the issue. That single stage furnace might be cheap, great, but it's not going to be very efficient at all. Why? Because it's cycling. And this, is, this cycling effect is not calculated in the efficiency rating of the appliance, unfortunately. So, what happens when we shut the furnace down? When you shut the furnace down, when that burner goes off after that five minute period, right? Because we're going to run for five minutes. So it comes on, it heats up the heat, heat exchanger inside the furnace, and when that heat exchanger is at temperature, then it'll start the blower and it'll warm the air as it passes across the heat exchanger. When it shuts down, it has to post purge all of that heat out, right? The burner has to has to post purge, move all the exhaust all the exhaust um, um, products out of the vent, so it's going to post purge down, and a lot of that heat is going to be lost. And then, when it sh when it turns on again, it's going to then have to heat that heat exchanger up again, and then then only deliver that into the house. So every time a gas appliance cycles, the efficiency goes down because we're taking all the heat that's been built up in the burner, in the heat exchanger, and we're exhausting it out. What does it mean for temperature stability? So if we're talking about, okay, let's leave efficiency out to one side, but let's talk about comfort. If I'm cycling three times an hour, if I'm on for five minutes and then off for 15, on for 5, off for 15, on for 5, off for 15 versus versus on for 60 minutes continuous at 15,000 BTUs. Which one do you think is going to be more comfortable for the homeowner in the space? On for 5, off for 15, on for 5, off for 15. You're definitely going to have more variability in that room where a unit is cycling than you would if you were able to modulate down to the actual BTU demanded at that time. And that's really the key. So not only are we talking about better efficiency, we're talking about better comfort delivery as well. So the better the furnace can modulate down to those lower inputs, the better the furnace is going to perform. So let's look. So now a two-stage, right? So a lot of a lot of the industry says, okay, well, single stage we know might be limited, but what about a two-stage? Well, a two-stage typically comes on at about 70% of maximum. So if maximum is 60,000 BTUs, stage one, right, the lower stage will be 70% of that, which in for the example is, is 42,000 BTUs. So let's look at that. Um, this time you install 95% two-stage furnace with stage one. And let's just assume, just to make the math easy, let's assume it's 75% or 45,000 BTUs. So stage one will be 45. You know, if it's 60,000, 75, 70% of that will be 42. But again, just to make the math easy. So stage one is at 45,000, stage two, 60,000 BTUs. So again, on a late October night, you only need 15, right? This is 15. Our minimum stage is 45. So this will give you the clue. We need 15, this is the lowest we can deliver. So even at stage one, it still is 45,000 BTUs. So it's still three times higher, right? Providing three times, the, three times more heat than we actually need at 15,000. So it has no choice to run one-third of the time. So it's going to be running for 20 minutes of every hour. So the single stage is running five, five minutes or, or 15 minutes of every hour. This one's going to run 20 minutes of every hour. Right? So let's look at that. So it could be on for seven minutes and then off for 13, but it'll still do, still do that same three cycles per hour. So all it does is, right in the first example, it was on for five, off for 15. Now we're going to run for seven and be off for 13, but still do three cycles an hour. So the thermostat's going to call for heat. Furnace will run at stage one, 
for seven minutes, delivering, right, delivering the 5,000 BTUs, and then it's satisfied, it's off for 13, and it repeats that three times each hour. So, three times five is still going to deliver the 15,000 BTUs, no question about it, it's going to meet your heat load. It's going to be on for 20 minutes, so better than the single stage, it was on for 15, and it'll off for 40, whereas the other, the single stage was off for, for uh, uh, off for 45. So it's still going to do three cycles per hour. So again, now let's look at the efficiency. Is it any better? Marginally, marginally perhaps, but not exactly where we need it to be if we're only needing 15,000 BTUs. What about temperature stability? Maybe a little bit better. We're running for seven minutes versus five off for 40 instead of 45. But again, marginally same issue. Unfortunately, same issue. So same situation. Now let's look at modulating condensing furnaces. And again, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to um, single out any manufacturer in particular. I'm just looking at, I went to the Energy Star website. I pulled down the top two furnaces in the market. And uh, this is the second one. Uh, it has an AFUE of 98.5. It's a carrier MN, uh, 59 MN7. It's Energy Star rated. It's got four models, starting at 60,000, then going to 80, 100, 120,000 BTUs. So four models, again, Energy Star rated. It has a patented gas valve that's able to modulate in 1% increments between 40 and 100. And this is the key, between 40 and 100. Now, what does this mean? Between 40% of its input, that means its minimum input is 40%. So 60,000 BTUs, which is the maximum input for this model, times 40%, which is the minimum modulation rate, gives us a minimum input of 24,000 BTUs, which means this furnace can operate between uh, 24 up to 60,000 BTUs, which gives us a turndown ratio of 2.5 to 1. What were we getting on the other equipment? significantly higher than 2.41 or 2.5 to 1. But again, remember that the minimum input, 24,000 BTUs. When we look at our load of 15,000 BTUs on this October night, how is that going to work? It's still going to cycle on and off. Why? Because the minimum input is still higher than the 15,000 required. So let's look at another Energy Star rated furnace. So this is the Lennox. Again, this is the highest furnace on the market, the SLP 98. Uh, has an AFUE of up to 98.7. Again, Energy Star rated with the minimum input being 66,000 BTUs. And then if you purchase the optional iComfort controller uh, and connect it to the furnace, you can modulate it again in 1% increments between 35 and 100. So the 35% is the minimum modulation rate. So what we do to figure out what the minimum input would be, we take our input for the smallest model, maximum input for the smallest model is 66,000 BTUs, because our heat load is 60,000, so this is the furnace we would select, times the 35% gives us our minimum input of 23,000 BTUs. So these are the two best modulating condensing furnaces in the market, right? 23 and 24,000 BTUs. What were we able to modulate down to on that 60,000 BTU boiler? 8,000 BTUs. So how is that going to perform? Well, let's go back to our example again, 60,000 BTUs. We install the 98.5% 60,000 BTU modulated with a minimum input of 24. Again, late October night, we need 15,000 BTUs. Even at its minimum, it's still providing almost 1.6 times the heat needed. So there's no choice to run, but to run two thirds of the time. So it'll run for 20 minutes, then it'll be off for 10, and I'll do two cycles every hour. So thermostat calls for heating, Furnace runs right down at its minimum at 24,000 BTUs for 20 minutes, delivering 7,500 BTUs. 
and then it has to turn down or it'll overheat because it can't go down to the 15,000. It's delivering more heat than needed, so it has to shut off before it overheats the space. So the thermostat will be satisfied, it'll shut down for 10 minutes, and then it's going to come on again and run for another 20 minutes. So it'll do that cycle twice an hour. So in those two cycles, it's going to deliver 2 times 7,500 BTUs, so it'll deliver the 15,000 no problem. Total number of minutes on, 40. Total number of minutes off, 20. So it's better than the other two for sure. It's cycling less. It's only do, doing two cycles versus the three cycles. So that's better. So the efficiency will definitely improve, no question about it. And the temperature stability, stability will be better because it's running for 40 minutes uh, rather than the, you know, the, the uh, five or seven minutes uh, per cycle that the other units were running at. Um, so it will be a better performing furnace than the others, but you're still going to have some variability. Why? Because you're going to be on for 40, off for 20, right? So you're going to be on for 20, off for 10, off for, on for 20, off for 10. So there will still be some variability, more than you would find with the boiler. So let's compare, right? So now we have the single stage furnace, we have the two stage, we have the variable speed modulating, and then we're comparing again to the, the Navians that we used in the example. So again, all of them are 60,000 BTUs because that was our heat load. So we're trying to match the maximum input of the furnace to the heat load of the home. But then let's look at our minimum to find out how much cycling there will be. Okay, well the single stage, it only runs at one speed, 60. So to one to one turn down ratio, that's not great, right? The larger the turn down ratio, the better performing because that is an indication of how many steps it can it can reduce down to uh, or how low relative to the maximum input it can go down to so even the two-stage furnace 42 at 1.4 to 1 even the modulating variable speed right it was 2.23 uh, thousand or 24 thousand giving us a 2.5 to 1 so these are the turn down ratios of the furnaces that we're looking at and compare that to in this case the the Navian where we've got the tankless at 4.5 to 1, right down to 13,000 BTUs. And that's a 200,000 BTU input burner on this Navian tankless, on the 248 and A2 and S2. And then on this unit, we've got a minimum input of 10,000. This is the 150,000 BTU input, giving us a 6 to 1 turndown ratio. On the NHB55, we have minimum input of 8,000 BTUs, 6.9 to 1. And then for the boiler, the NCBE, 60,000 BTUs with a minimum input of 12, giving us a 5 to 1 turn down. So these units, all of these units will run at the 15,000, not cycle at all. All of these above units will definitely cycle. More, the first, the single stage and the two stage, definitely more than modulating. Um, but, um, but the furnaces will all mod, or the, the the water-based systems will all modulate much lower. So, question for you. And this, let's look at AFUE for a moment. The heat loss is calculated based on the amount of window to wall, uh, amount of windows to wall, the insulation value of the windows, the doors, the exterior wrap, uh, the attic, um, the wall tightness, or the, sorry, the tightness of the building, um, right? The number of air exchanges, etc. So it's it's not a function of the equipment that's installed, right? You measure the R value in the walls, the R value in the attic, the the amount, the square footage of window to wall ratio, and then the R value of the window. So all of that goes into your heat load calculation, right? Insulation, windows that you're using, the exterior wrap, the number of air changes. So would you agree that a heat loss on a 1,600 square foot home, for example, does not change based on the appliance used? We're not looking at the appliances when we're looking at these metrics. We're looking at the design temperature, outdoor design temperature, and we're looking at the R values of the equipment that you're, or of the insulation value that you're putting in. That's how we calculate the heat load. So the heat loss is going to be exactly the same whether we use a 95% AFUE furnace or a 95% AFUE boiler 
with, with an iFlow, for example. The equipment is, it doesn't matter. Right? The heat load is the same. The other thing, the seasonal pattern for the area that you're located in won't change. It's going to be the same year after year after year. Um, you know, it's going to be zero as we come out of summer into fall and then go down to your maximum load and then get warmer as we go into spring. That's going to repeat year after year after year. Right? So those things, the heat load and the seasonality don't change. What needs to change is the equipment's ability to modulate or, or adjust to this variability. So let's get back to our question about AFUE. So again, the heat load doesn't change and our seasonality doesn't change. So the equipment needs to be able to perform to both of those requirements. So if we look at installing a furnace or a boiler with an iFlow, for example, Again, our heat load is 60,000 BTUs. We'll continue with that same example. In this case, we're going to assume that stage one is even lower at 50%, which is rare. Most of the time they're at you know, 70, 65%, but let's just assume for math purposes, it's at 50. So our minimum input's 30,000 BTUs, giving us a two to one turndown ratio. And let's say in AFU we have 95% on that single, or that two stage. And then we've got the variable speed modulating, Again, 60,000, minimum input 24, 2.5 to 1, 98.5 AFUE. So both very high AFUEs. Now we're going to install the boiler with the iFlow, and the boiler is going to provide the hot water for the iFlow. 60,000 B2 boiler, let's say a, a, you know, a 7,000 minimum input, so we've got a, a 9 to almost a 9 to an 8.6 to 1 turndown ratio, and we've got a, an AFUE of that on that boiler of 95%. So, here's the question for you. We have 95% furnace, single stage. We have a 98.5% fully modulating variable speed furnace. Or we have a boiler with an iFlow with a, uh, also with an AFU of 95%. Which is going to perform more? All 60,000 BTUs, so they meet the load of the house at 60,000 BTUs. All have high AFUE numbers. So, intuitively you may say, well, the APUEs are high and the sizes are the same, so it doesn't matter. They all should perform similarly in the house. But based on what we just looked at and the cycling effect, which one do you think is going to be, let's say, more and more comfortable? And how should we assess that? How should we pick you know, between these appliances? What, should we, what else should we look at? We know that the maximum movement is the same, so it covers the load in the middle of January and February. This minimum input is critically important now to be able to, or to assessing the equipment that we use with the iFlow, um, knowing that our seasonality curve will always be there. So, am I going to buy this one with 30,000 as the minimum input, or 24, or 7,000? Which one do you think is going to be more comfortable? Which one's, which one's going to cycle less? And why? The minimum input of the two-stage furnace is 4.3 times higher than the minimum input of the boiler. The Energy Star labeled furnace is still 3.4 times higher. Right? The minimum input is still 3.4 times higher than the boiler. Which one's going to be able to modulate better? The boiler, no question. At 7,000 BTUs, it can cover more of that curve that we looked at much more of that curve without cycling than the two-stage or the modulating condensing. So, even though the boiler and the furnaces have similar AFUEs, the actual performance, and there's absolutely no question, however, that the boiler with the iFlow is going to deliver a better efficiency than these two units and better comfort than those two units because it's going to cycle less and it's going to be a high it's going to deliver a higher thermal efficiency than both of these furnaces by more than x percent what's your guess at x percent how much better how much how much more efficient is this system going to be than these two furnaces what's your guess 
Because the minimum input is lower, there will be much less on-off cycling. And less cycling equals better efficiency and better comfort. So not only are you delivering better efficiency with this option, better comfort as well. So the feedback I get from many contractors when we do training across North America, hey, the furnace I use, they're already ENERGY STAR labeled, they're already, you know, have an AFUE of 96, 97. How much better can it be, really? How much more efficient can it be? Going back to our X, right? I asked you to guess at X. So how much more? Well, maybe two percent, maybe three, one percent. Like, does that and does that really matter? Do not be misled by AFUE. AFUE is like quoting your car's MPG highway when almost all of your driving is going to be done in the city. So really, if we are to to use that car analogy. We should have an AFUE test that also gives us MPG City and maybe blends the two or at least shows us, okay, when you're driving in the middle of January, when the furnace, right, in the middle of January, February, the furnace has to operate at that 60,000 BTUs, then you'll be driving at your MPG highway. But in October and November, and March and April where we're out of the main season where we have to modulate a bit then we can look at the MPG city but the FUE doesn't give it it just gives us one number and unfortunately it doesn't incorporate that negative efficiency effect of the cycling right when the furnace turns off post purges that heat up heat out and then when it has to reheat those Cycling losses are not incorporated into the AFUE number, uh, and as a result, um, or and, and because of that, that part load cycling, which continues through the majority of your heating season, right? It's only January and February where you actually get down to maximum load where you need. The rest should be, uh, the rest is going to be lower than lower uh, amounts of heat required. That's why the manufacturers use qualifiers like potential for savings and as high as or up to 98.5 or whatever the case may be. They'll never tell you that they're always going to operate at 98%. Never. No, no manufacturer is going to tell you that. But unfortunately, the Energy Star program uses AFUE as its main determinant. But there's a flaw, right? And we're, we're identifying the flaw. So what is that, how does that flaw look and, and how do we compare it? So there was a testing done and they took eight furnaces and they, they ran eight furnaces against a, a heating load and we'll look at what that load is. So they just assumed a heating load and they did it for a number of different places across the US for example and then they modeled the iFlow with a condensing modulating tankless and looked at the results. So they compared the eight furnaces to that load and then they compared the iFlow with the condensing furnace or condensing tankless to the same load and these are the results. So the line in red is the iFlow with the condensing modulating tankless as a combi system running the heating and then the the gray line, the dark gray line, is the averaged, the averaged um, performance of the eight furnaces. Now, why did I take the average? Well, I don't know if you're going to use furnace manufacturer A or B or C or D, right? And there are many out there. There are, you know, there's there's Lennox, there's Carrier, there's Train, there's Goodman, there's Nortec. Um, I don't know which one you're going to use. And are you going to use their um, their modulating condensing one? Are you going to use their single stage one? Are you going to use their two stage? We don't know. We don't know. What I can say is that of all of those eight tested, all those furnace, eight furnaces tested, not one of them individually outperformed the iFlow combi system. Not one. So we beat all eight of them. So then, but because we didn't know which one you're going to use, we averaged, we averaged them. 
Now, when I mentioned those names before, those weren't necessarily in this test. I'm not going to say which ones are in there and which ones weren't in there. Um, but when we average those furnace results, right, on a point-by-point -point basis, this was the average curve. So, when you look at this, so again, all of these are condensing furnaces. Seven of eight of these are on the Energy Star program today. Seven of eight of them are still in the Energy Star program. And this is how they perform. So when they're running at that 60,000 BTU level, they're running at fairly high AFUE, or high, high efficiency. No problem. And this is thermal. This isn't the AFUE as such. But as the heating load goes down, right? Here we have our heating load on the baseline. Right? We're at 3,000, 9,000, 24,000, 30,000, 42, 54, 60,000. As, as that furnace, or as the furnaces are required to deliver at lower, lower BTU levels, representing the seasonality of it, so it could be, right, this could be replicating October or November or March or April, where we don't need full load, we need partial load. How do the units perform? Well, you can see that their efficiency starts to drop off fairly significantly. Now, with the iFlow and the modulating condensing tankless, the efficiencies are better. And why do you think? Because the turndown ratio is better. The, the, the ability of the tankless unit to modulate to those lower inputs is much better than the furnaces were, as we saw. As a result, it's going to get better efficiency on this lower end where we have to be able to modulate. Now, you see with these two boundaries, these dotted boundaries, we have between three and 30,000 BTUs. You can say, okay, well, if we're operating in this section, right, if we have a 60,000 BTU and our heat load is up here, then, you know, that's probably where the majority of, of the heating is and that's where we should look at. But now we're looking at this range bounded by these two dotted lines and we're saying, Okay, why are we looking at that area, right? Obviously there's some difference here, but the question is how much of our heating season is in this range? Well, let's take a look. Before we do that, so we, based on the average and the difference, the difference differential between average, there's a 12.5% advantage of the eye flow and the, the modulating condensing tankless than, um, uh, than the furnaces. And then on the higher end, on this 30,000 BTU test load, we're looking at a 5.5%. So in this range between these two, we're looking at an average energy efficiency increase of 9%. That's significant because these are all energy star rated furnaces. These are all condensing furnaces with very high AFUEs. And we're outperforming them by an average of 9% over this range. So... You can say, okay, but do we really need it? How often are we in that range? Well, I showed you the seasonality of it, but if let's look at some, uh, let's some, let's look at some other um, metrics. So this graph is from Natural Resources Canada, um, from their uh, planning guide for mechanical systems from 2017, and what they did is they modeled a 1,400 square foot home in different, home, different locations in Canada. And then they measured it based, or they assessed it based on basic or standard building code. Energy Star for new homes, which is 20% better than standard building code. And then to R2000, or let's say similar to net zero, if you will, a 50% better performance than baseline. Right, so you have standard construction, Energy Star for new homes, and then you have the R2000 or net zero which is 50% better than standard. So, this 1,400 square foot home, even at standard building code, in some of the coldest parts, this is the prairies in Canada, less than 30,000 BTUs is your load in the middle of January and February. That's your design load. What about Toronto? 1,400 square foot home in Toronto, under 20,000 BTUs is your load in the middle of January. That's your design load. That's your target load for this 1,400 square foot single detached home. 
Why? Because all of our building materials are getting better. Our heating loads are going down. So, when you look at this, now let's look at Energy Star. So let's say they're building 20% better than standard. What's my load in Toronto? Maybe 17,000 BTUs, 18,000 BTUs, total load. R2000, now we're maybe about 12,000 BTUs. So again, all to say, the heat loads are going down. So you say, okay, well maybe Canada's using some great technology that you know the U.S. isn't. Is that, rep, rep, is that similar to the U.S.? Well, in the U.S. there was a similar, similar study done. And this study looked at 10 different locations, five of them being quite cold, right? We have Bismarck, uh, Bozeman, Montana, Bismarck, North Dakota, Madison, Wisconsin, Chicago, and Albany, New York. And then offsetting that, we've got some more moderate. Right? Obviously, Portland's not going to be as cold because it's on the West Coast, uh, but it's going to be damp, and it's going to be it's going to get down to you know 45, maybe low or high 30s. Um, not too much snow in Portland or Seattle, but nonetheless, it will get uh, it'll get uh, it'll get cold and damp. Um, Nashville will get a little bit cold in the evening. Um, Birmingham, Alabama, and then we've got you know Austin, which is not going to get too bad, and then LA. They took the heat loads of those ten homes, and again, five of them are quite cold, right? These are all definitely cold winter. They have solid winters. And then I would say these two have winters as well, and then the bottom two might be offset. So this curve might, because of LA and Austin, might be a little bit offset to the left, which is a lower BTU, but for the most part, this, is the, this curve represents the average of a 1,600 square foot home for all of those 10 locations. Right? So you just average the heat load to give us an average curve for the US, and this is the curve. How often do we use 60,000 BTUs? Almost never. 50? 4? Almost never. 48? Almost never. Two-stage furnace, minimum input, 42,000. How often are we using it? Almost never. 36? A little bit. 30? Okay, now we start to get into the rise of the curve. Where is our main heating load? Between 9 and 18, with a peak at 12. 12,000 BTUs. 1,600 square foot single detached home. Again, average of all these, including the five cold areas. This is, if we we're to pick a curve for North America, this would be it. These numbers, very similar to the Intercan numbers, where we're looking at right, 20, 30, these are maximum heating loads in the middle of January. This is the distribution. So, now if we take our curve, right, these are our result, our efficiency curves, and we plot it against the distribution curve, right? Of these 10 homes, now you can see that now you can see why we banded by the 3 and the 30. We said, okay, this is your heating load. So what is the efficiency gain during this heating load? This is it. That's why. That's why we can say we're 9 or 10% more efficient on average than even these best furnaces. There's the plot. And again, it's not rocket science. Why, why was the eye flow with the modulating condensing tankless able to outperform? Because in these BTU loads, 9, 6, 9, 12, 18, 24, we're able to modulate without cycling. We're able to run at 10,000 BTUs, 8,000 BTUs, 12,000 BTUs without cycling. Whereas the furnaces were not able to. So the furnaces are cycling a number of times per hour and losing efficiency. So again, 9% over 7 Energy Star rated furnaces. So, heating loads are decreasing. Why are they decreasing? The improved building technology, better insulation, better windows and doors, better exterior envelopes. Everything is getting tighter, you're not seeing the same heat loads. On the other side, the cooling loads are actually increasing. Why? Even though we have better window technology, the square footage of installed windows compared to wall is increasing. We're using more, more glass. Thus, the heating loads are increasing, also combined with 
we're, 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 the temperatures outside are actually warming, right? We are seeing that uh, across North America where our average temperatures are increasing a little bit. Um, so we're using more window and our outdoor temperatures are getting warmer. So with these two effects, what do we need? Well, we need the heating and cooling equipment to be able to deliver efficiently, not only at the maximum input, right? Not only at that 60,000 BTU level or on the AC side at my three tons or four tons, but I need to be able to modulate and, and operate efficiently throughout the season to those variable inputs. And unfortunately, the single stage, two stage, and even the variable speed are not meeting the demands of today's homes. So with regards to heating and cooling equipment, it's clear that the industry needs to have minimum inputs that are lower. The turndown ratios need to be higher. Why? Be able to deal with not only the whole home load, but also the partial loads throughout the season, and they need to deal with them efficiently, but also comfortably, because the cycling will definitely affect the comfort of the home as well. So the heating can't always be cycling, and the AC can't always you know, risk uh, freezing on micro, micro loads. Um, if not, then cycling, poor efficiency, and temperature swings will continue. The iFlow combi system, the outperformance is not rocket science. Right? Again, it's the ability of the tankless or the boiler to modulate down to those lower inputs without the need to cycle, maintaining the efficiency, maintaining the comfort. And then when the iFlow gets that warmer water, it can then run for the entire hour and adjust automatically with its strategy to maximize the efficiency of the air distribution through the home. So the pairing of that low, or the, the, the low modulating equipment or the, the, the equipment to be able to modulate to the lower inputs combined with what the iFlow is doing gives you the most comprehensive and fully optimized forced air system available on the market. Compared to any furnace, we have no problem. You want to bring your furnace, whatever furnace that is, and compare it to our system, we will outperform, not, no question. Why? Because we result in longer run times, so at lower inputs using less energy, delivering better temperature consistency, quieter operation because we're running just at the CFM rate, just at the input you need, not any more, not any less giving longer life expectancy to the equipment because we're not cycling on and off and, and, and going through, you know, putting the equipment and the components of the equipment through, you know, lots of on and off cycles. We're running continuously. Just get it going and let it run steady. And then continuous operation of the system is the ideal for comfort. So that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to deliver comfort and efficiency and that's how we're doing it. So, I'm going to stop there for this part and we'll continue in part two.